as the uh, film had shown, um, the original promise of the European Union that there would be a convergence uh, as to income and as to uh, social structures has not been has not been fulfilled. Indeed, in the last 10 years, not only has there been no uh, genuine convergence, but in some respects, there has uh, developed an increasing divergence uh, among uh, the European countries and particular European regions. My task today is to explore why that has happened and what can be done about it. I should perhaps clarify at the outset that I am not going to be talking about labor laws and the rights of employees uh, with respect to which actually the European Union has done a creditable job in harmonizing terms and conditions for employment. There's more to do, but there's reasonable progress in that regard. What is so extraordinarily striking in this situation is that the European Union has done nothing at all whatsoever to create conditions for macroeconomic harmonizations. The macroeconomic policies are unable within the European Union, they don't exist, to bring about any genuine convergence in wages and social, social conditions. How did that come about? Why did that happen? Why is this enormous gaping hole? It's striking. Well, if you, if you look at it this way, um, the national income of a country, or indeed the national income, the total income of the European Union, uh, can be, according to very basic economic theory, divided into two parts. Uh, what part of that national income goes to labor and what part of it goes to capital. So it's a twofold uh, division, labor versus capital. Um, it has been the absolutely traditional, at least since the 18th century, the traditional task of politics to moderate and mediate and arbitrate the division of income between the various segments of society uh, who compete for whatever share they think they are entitled to in that, in that income. Um, the European Union came into <coughs> being uh, in a way that has very seriously compromised the ability of the nation states to continue to perform this task. European Union essentially has set up terms and conditions whereby the nation states no longer have those tools that have traditionally been developed, fiscal and monetary tools, to carry out this arbitration between the various segments of society. If there is a, a cyclical downturn, governments use stimulative measures to get the economy going again. If there's danger of inflation, they will take measures to cool the economy down, and so on and so forth. And if there are regional differences through development aid and various other programs, they will try to mitigate and, and, and reduce uh, those differences. Well, uh, the introduction of the euro has, of course, taken away monetary policy from the member states and has transferred monetary policy instruments to Frankfurt, the European Central Bank, which has one monetary policy for the entire Euro region. But the entire Euro region is nowhere near equal, nowhere near comparable, and one monetary policy for the entire Euro region is simply inappropriate and wholly inadequate. At the same time, the member states are left without the means with which to mitigate what economists call asymmetrical shocks or shocks of any particular kind that may befall them through various circumstances in terms of event. Now, uh, on the fiscal side, we have Maastricht, and Maastricht, once again, takes away the kind of fiscal tools that governments would otherwise have to mitigate, to direct the economy, and to perform, as I say, that quite fundamental political task 
of mediating in society among the competing groups in the income and generating the kind of social consensus with which the distribution of income between capital, labor, and within labor, the various classes of labor, uh, is deemed to be or is thought to be by society to be reasonably fair, equitable, and acceptable. Today, governments in the European Union simply do not have the means with which to respond to that task. All right, well, they have taken it away. What have they given to replace it with? And here's the problem, nothing. The European Union's structure, therefore, has a very serious built-in bias in favor of capital and in opposition to labor. Because it is labor that has taken the consequences of this move, of the shift of the, of the tools from the national level to, to, to the European Union. And the European Union, in return, has absolutely no means with which to replace what it has taken away. Okay? And this is actually not very surprising, and it would be nice to say that this was an unintended consequence of the European Union, but, but, but maybe not. Maybe it wasn't an unintended consequence. Um, in 1941, Friedrich Hayek, the great um, uh, neoliberal uh, uh, economist, published an article in an American journal called The Commonwealth, uh, in which he uh, very much favored the eventual formation of a European Union. And his argument was that with the formation of the European Union, the nation state will lose the means with which to govern, and the Union will not be in a position to replace what has been lost. And therefore, for a neoliberal, of course, this is very important. The nation states should have fewer tools, fewer powers, fewer means. So therefore, from his point of view, this was an entirely welcome idea and, 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 and development. Um, now, uh, the shift in favor of capital at the expense of labor uh, has been remarkable. Uh, in sort of rule of thumb idea, generally speaking, it is said that it should be roughly like 65% for labor and 35% for capital, give or take a few percentage points given a particular situation of a given country. Well, at this stage in the European Union, capital has more than 60%, uh, uh, sorry, more than 40%, and labor has less than 60%. So it's been a great shift away from labor to capital. Apart from the political tensions and the moral issues that this question raises, there is a purely economic uh, aspect uh, of the problem, namely that as you shift income away from labor and uh, dire direct it to capital, you reduce the effective purchasing power of society. With the reduction in purchasing power, you get eventually a reduction in the return on investment. And with the eventual return on investment, you get into a deflationary spiral. And that, of course, was the, great, the origin of the great deflationary spiral with which Europe has been struggling after the 2008 uh, uh, calamity. Now, um, the, the um, shift, therefore, is a shift in the other direction, where labor gets too much and capital gets too little, is also quite harmful. Uh, because that means that the return on investment disappears, uh, the funds dry up, and again, you get, into, you get into an inflationary spiral in that case, you get an inflationary situation, also equally destructive. What is so striking in the European situation today is that the shift away from labor to capital in favor of capital is accompanied by the rise of the offshore phenomenon. 
because a lot of that money that has been taken away from labor and shifted to capital finds its way into offshore uh, uh, accounts. And of course, through, that, off, through those offshore accounts, those funds are recycled in the form of debt with which the otherwise lost purchasing power due to the shift away from labor to capital is replaced. So labor gets less money in its pocket from its work, and the, redu and the reduction in what it gets is compensated by ever-increasing indebtedness. And that is how this absolutely dreadful and very, very harmful debt, uh, debt trap, debt trap cycle developed and is still very much in effect. So we now have on the horizon, uh, for example, the very serious danger facing the Italians, where over 20% of household debt is now non-performing. The nation has uh, an indebtedness of 133% of its GDP, and the debt throughout the economy is simply rising, and there's no growth in the economy. That's the, that's, that's the vicious circle um, that, you, that, you get, that you get into. Um, for, this, for the countries of Eastern and Central Europe, there is a double problem in, in addition to the one I just described, the shift from labor to capital. And that double problem is that they have been persuaded that in this emerging uh, economic structure of the European Union, their place is in the, low, uh, the lowest level of the uh, added value chain, value added chain. All right, so they've been persuaded that they should be competing. The, 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 the proper way for them to compete in this world is through low labor costs, and that they should structure their economies and their societies, their educational system, everything else, in order to provide uh, the more developed countries with cheap labor. So not only is there a shift away from from labor to capital in the sense I have just described, there is a double whammy in the promotion of a, uh, a economic policy that sees Eastern and Central Europe as a source of cheap labor. Uh, we have the very, very difficult task of dissolving both of these problems uh, more or less simultaneously, because if we don't dissolve it, we are going to have very, very serious problems. I don't think that there is any question in any reasonable economist's mind that the current situation is unsustainable. This situation, if it continues, will tear the European uh, Union apart. There's no other way to put it. It's as simple as that. All right, so let me just quickly say what I see could be done about it because after all, it's very nice to, to explain these things. So what are you going to do about it? Uh, the first point is that the, um, <laughs> from among all the commissioners of the European Union, there is one commissioner sorely missing, which would be the commissioner who was supposed to have been responsible for what the European Union was about in the first place. And that would be a commissioner for convergence. Of all the stuff that they are doing, the one thing about which they don't have a concentrated, systematic, scientifically well-founded structure is the study of convergence. Why is there a problem with This is a continue, should be a continuous study. There should be a commissioner for convergence who has a filter with which he examines each and every proposal that comes to the European Union and determines whether that proposal enhances or hinders convergence. There is no, as, as you know, in uh, these days, the environmental impact statements that are very popular in most, most legislatures, and right, rightly so, if I may say so. Uh, but it would be high time for the European Union to require a convergence impact statement on all of the initiatives that we see, that we see taking place. So that's the first one a commissioner for convergence, with regular annual reports, well-staffed, and so on and so forth. 
The second point is that as a, a group of economists led by, I think, James McCulloch of, of, Ire, of uh, Scotland in the 70s, pointed out that this 1%, now 1.7% uh, GDP budget for the European Union is wholly inadequate to the tasks facing the Union. Wholly inadequate. And as he rightly said, if, you want, if you're serious about convergence and European unity, you need to be thinking about the 5% budget as a minimum. So that's the second point. Does the European Union have the sorts of resources with which the problem that we are talking about today can be addressed? No, it does not. It does not. You know, a lot of people talk about the United States as an example, how they do it. Well, the United States federal government has a budget equal to 22% of the American GDP. They have 22% with which to deal with the sort of problems that we are talking about today. The U European Union is trying to do that with 1.7% today. It's to wholly inadequate. Third, the offshore nonsense has got to be stopped. Now, uh, you know, people are uh, 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 saying how incredibly difficult it is, how they're not able to do that, how, uh, nonsense. Offshore can be stopped within a matter of weeks if we want to stop it. If we have been able to uh, mount a very effective uh, boycott and embargo against the Russians, there's absolutely no reason why we cannot mount an embargo against offshore uh, tax havens. So that's the third proposal. Indeed, I would suggest that offshore transactions should be taxed by the European Union at an appropriate rate, which will bring in the budget figure that I have described as being uh, appropriate. So offshore transactions should be taxed, that revenue should supplement the current revenue of the European Union, and that will give you the 5% type figure with which these kinds of problems can be addressed. The fourth problem is tax harmonization. More effort needs to be done in that regard. And finally, the euro, which is a big villain in this pile, a big problem, uh, the euro needs serious reformation, the terms and conditions of the euro. And in particular, you see, the euro is structured so that anything that harms capital is seriously punished. So all the criteria, the maximum amount of indebtedness, the budget deficit, everything else, limitations, that is a no-no. But if you're in surplus, such as Germany or some other countries, that's okay. Well. That surplus is just as much a problem as the deficit on the other side, because that surplus is the other guy's deficit. And therefore, the, European, the, the euro needs to be reformed where the surplus is just as much fined, punished, prohibited as the deficit is. Countries in surplus should be required on pain of penalty to take appropriate macroeconomic measures that reduce, eliminate, mitigate that surplus.